the word. I always say this. James says at one point, those who teach will be judged harshly. So whenever you are asked to speak in the house of God, it's not, it's not, it's not a small honor, it's a great honor. And I am humbled to stand before you today and speak the word of God. Amen. Amen. Zachariah says at one point, it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. So it's never because we are eloquent. It's never because we are able. It's because he is the one who gives us the ability. Amen. So today I'm going to talk about how to become God's favorite lessons from the life of David. Amen. Amen. So what happened uh, to me sometime this week, I had a friend who called me and she had been asked to preach at church back home in Zimbabwe and she said, um, I've been asked to preach about faithfulness and I'm supposed to talk about people who kept the faith in the Bible and can you tell me some people? I, I know you, you can tell me a few people if I ask. And then I just say, you know what, the first person that just comes to my mind is David. And she responded, no, David doesn't work because he's a special case. He was just loved by God. And, and after that conversation, it got, I got to thinking, what exactly about David's life made him a favorite? He, he was not a particularly faithful human being. He was not particularly good in of himself. He made mistakes like you and me. So what exactly from his life made him God's favorite? And I started reading and understanding from the book of 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, the book of Kings, the Chronicles. And the more I read, I want to believe that the Holy Spirit led me to aspects of his life that we can learn, that both me and you can learn to understand how he became God's favorite. Amen. Amen. And the first thing that I want to talk about that defined David was that he had a repentant heart. Amen. Okay, we are going to leave, read a lot of scriptures today. Please bear with me. Amen. Amen. The first scripture that I'm going to read is from the book of 2 Samuel chapter 11, um, from verse 1 to 11. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The men said she is but Sheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Gittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. Then she went back home. The woman sent, con conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. So David sent this word to Joab, sent me Uriah the Gittite. And Joab sent him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab how was, how the soldiers were, and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace, and the gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master's servants and did not go down to his house. David was, David was told Uriah did not go home. So he asked Uriah, haven't you just come from a military campaign? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in the tents, and my commander Joab and my Lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house, eat and drink, and make love to my wife? As surely as you live, I will do no such thing. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it he wrote, put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fiercest, then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. So while Joab had sit with the seat under siege, he put Uriah at a place where he was the strong, where the strongest defenders were. When the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word. Now I'm going to read my second scripture. Um, 1 Kings chapter 21, verse 1 to 5. Some time later, there was an incident involving a vineyard belonging to Naboth the Jezreelite. The vineyard was in Jericho, close to the palace Ahab, close to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. Ahab said to Naboth, In exchange, I will give you a better vineyard, or if you prefer, I will pay you whatever it is worth. 
But Naboth replied, the Lord forbid I shall give you the inheritance of my ancestors. So Ahab went home sullen and angry because Naboth, the Israelite, had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my ancestors. Um, okay, I, I, will, I, will, I, will, I will just summarize that one. So the first story that we read was David. He was at the roof of his palace and he saw a woman called Bathsheba bathing. And the Bible said he lusted after her and he took her and he slept with her and she conceived. And as if that wasn't worse enough, after David did that, he tried to set Uriah up so that the pregnancy would be his. And he brought back Uriah from battle and he tried to get Uriah to sleep with his wife. But Uriah refused and David had him killed. And I want you to notice something. In the second story that we read in 1 Kings chapter 21, this is a different king. He's a king called Ahab. And Ahab committed the same sin that David committed. He was at the roof of his palace and he saw Naboth's vineyard. And the Bible says he wanted the vineyard for himself. And he said to Naboth, I want your vineyard. Give it to me. And Naboth said, I will not sell you the, my, the inheritance of my ancestors. And the response that Ahab did is exactly the response that David did. So Ahab went back to his wife Jezebel and said, I am sad because Naboth refused to sell me his vineyard. And Je Jezebel said, that's a small issue, we'll deal with him. So Ahab, together with Jezebel, they had Naboth killed and they took his vineyard. So David committed the same sin that Ahab committed, but the response from God was, God sent Nathan to confront David, and when David was confronted, oh king, Nathan came to him and he presented a scenario, and he said, king, there was a man who was rich with many sheep, but when visitors came, he took his neighbor's only sheep and slaughtered it for them. And the Bible says David was so angry. And he said to, to, to Nathan, that man has to be killed today. And Nathan said, that man is you, O king. And the response to that is, you find it in Psalm 51, David went on his knees and he said, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew the right spirit within me. Who am I that you have so loved me? He went to God, he broke down, he cried and he begged. He had a repentant heart and God forgave him and gave him another chance. But if you go to Ahab, after he committed that sin, the word of God came and said, in the same spot that Naboth's blood was licked by dogs, so will your own blood be licked by dogs. And the Bible says, Ahab temporarily repented. And if you read the Bible, the last scripture of 1 Kings chapter 21, it says that God said, yes, Ahab not repented, and the case was temporarily lifted. But soon after that, he went back to his ways. And if you continue reading and you go to 2 Kings, you will hear at a time when Ahab was in battle with Jeroboam, and with, no, no, with Jehoshaphat, and when they went in, Ahab tried to disguise himself. So he said to Jehoshaphat, they want to kill me, so you should go dressed as me, and they want to attack you, they will attack me. And what is interesting is there was a man from the enemy's army, from the army of the enemies, he had never shot his bow, he was practicing, and a random arm killed Ahab, and his blood indeed Hallelujah. spelled was licked by dogs because he was an unrepentant man. So the difference between Ahab and David is they both sinned against God, but David repented. So for us to become God's servants, we don't have to be perfect in and of ourselves. We just have to have a perfect relationship with him. David had a repentant heart. Because Yes, so when Paul was speaking briefly about the history of Israel, and he said in the past there were judges, and then David became king, the man after God's own heart, the man who took somebody's wife and killed him. The difference between him and Ahab is he repented. And I want you to notice something else. If you go to First Kings, First Kings chapter 11, and you are told about how Solomon lost the kingdom of Israel when it was given to Jeroboam, the thing that made Solomon fall was women. The Bible says he loved foreign women, and because he loved them, they pulled them away from his God. And the Solomon, David loved women first, married Saul's daughter, took Abel, Abigail from Nabal, took Bathsheba, and at some point he get to a point he married ten women, he has many concubines. But in all his flaws, he was still humble and repentant before God. Solomon committed the same sins, and the Bible says he refused to repent of his ways. And when he refused to repent, God sent a hitter and said, Solomon, I have right. torn the kingdom into ten. I will do four pieces. I will take the ten away from you and give them to Jeroboam. I will leave one in your house for the sake of my servant David. He was not a perfect man. He was a repentant man. When we ask people to be perfectionists, when we ask people to never sin, we are asking too 
too much of them because they are human beings. Jeremiah says the heart is evil above all yeah, things. Yeah, yes. It's it's in our blood. It's in the, you know what? One time my, my sister has three little kids and the first one, the, the younger brother was drinking water and then the first one took it and threw it out. Why did you do that? And she laughed. And my sister said, Aha, we are born in Minipit. Yeah. Who even taught her to do this? She was just being antagonistic. She's the child. She was just being antagonistic because we are born in Minipit. It's in us. And for us to be God's servants, we don't have to be perfect in and of ourselves. We need to have repentant hearts. And to go there before God and say, God, I submit my heart to you. Examine my motives. Examine my motives. Examine my heart. Amen. That's the, Amen. the second thing that made David a favorite of God is he had an understanding of the nature of God. I'm going to read you one of my favorite passages of scriptures in the Bible. You find it in the book of First Chronicles, chapter 21. I'm going to read a few verses, verse 1, 3, 5, 7, and 15. I will read it. Please bear with me. Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take census of Israel. So David said to Joab and the commanders of the troops, Go and count the Israelites from Beersheba to Dan. Then report back to me so that I may know how many they are. But Joab replied, May the Lord multiply, multiply his troops a hundred times over. A hundred times over. My Lord the King, are they not all the Lord's subjects? Why does my Lord want to do this? Why should he bring about guilty on Israel? This command was so evil in the sight of God, so he punished Israel. Then David said to God, I have sinned greatly by doing this. Now I beg you, take away the guilt of your servant. I have done a foolish thing. The Lord said to God, David, see, go and tell David, this is what the Lord says, I am giving you three options. Choose one of them for me to carry out against you. So God went to David and said to him, this is what the Lord says, take your choice, three years of famine, Three months of being swept away before your enemies and the word overtaking you. Or three days of the sword of the Lord. Days of blood in the land with the angel of the Lord ravaging every part of Israel. Now then decide how I should answer the one who sent me. David said to God, I am in deep distress. Let me fall into the hands of the Lord, for his mercy is very great, but do not let me fall into human hands. And, and, so where we have read, this is first this is first first Chronicles chapter 21, where we have read David also ordered a census. And when he ordered the census, Joab, his army commander, was actually against it. And he said, King, this is not a command from God. We are not supposed to do this. Amen. But the Bible makes it clear that an evil spirit had swept across him. And when that command was partially carried out, God was angry. Amen. And God gave David three options. Yeah. And he said, choose one punishment yeah. that you want for yourself. The first punishment is three years of famine in the land. Yeah. The second one is three months in the hands of your enemies. Yeah. And the last one is three days where I will deal with you on my own yeah. and bring plague on the land. Yeah. And one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible, David said, I know I have sinned against you, God, yeah. but don't put me in my hands of my enemies. Yeah. Deal with yeah. me on my own. Oh, yeah. And if you read Book of Zikanah, it says that the angel of the Lord came and he smote Israel. Yeah. And the moment he did that, seven people died and God looking from heaven shouted enough the punishment that was supposed to last for three days only happened once because true to the nature of God he was merciful and he redeemed Israel so David understood that if people deal with you they don't have the mercy and the
David understood the nature of God. Amen. After I read that scripture, my prayer every day is God. I don't know who I've offended today. Don't let them deal with me, God. Deal with me personally. Amen. I don't want to be dealt with people, with people at church. I don't want to be dealt with my parents and my boss because human beings don't have the grace to say enough. They will milk you until the last drop of blood. They will make you suffer. Human beings hold grudges for 10 years. Human beings hold grudges for people who have long died. Because human beings hold on to things. But David understood the nature of God. And what is the nature of God? He is just. He is faithful. He is merciful. He wants you to have a repentant heart. Who took things that you were supposed to do? Mm-hmm. The humility 
with this man. He made a declaration in his palace and the prophet supported him. And the prophet came back to confront him and to tell him he was wrong. He is a king. He has ego. He has pride. He could have just built the temple because he had the resources. He could have just been proud enough to say, I can do it. What's going to happen? But he was humble enough to admit that he was wrong. He was humble enough to take the counsel of the prophet. And he was humble enough to prepare his son to build the temple that he was denied the ability to build. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Because he had a track record of God saying yes to him. Mm -hmm. He had a track record of God showing up for him. He had a track record of God showing up to defend his word. And he knew in that moment that God might have said no to me, but his plans for me are an expected end. Oh, he yes. loves me oh, so yes. much and he knew me before I was so in my mother's home. Surely yeah. he's saying But David did not do that. He understood that even though 
know God has given me this plan. He is a God who works in mysterious ways in different circumstances. So if I'm going to, 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 to rely on past experiences, I might miss it. So the best bet is for me to go back and consult. And he went back and God said, Last time I said go and attack them full force. This time go around them. Do you see what happened? If he had used the previous strategy, they would have butchered him and his soldiers. If he had, used, if he had relied on his past victories, they would have defeated him and his soldiers. So the fact that he went back to inquire to God, it meant that God gave him a new strategy. They know that God works in mysterious ways and God has blessings. What God told you in 2023 is not the same God told you in 2024. Never be so comfortable in your life to think that you know what God wants you to do. Never be so comfortable in your life to think that you have all the answers. Never be so comfortable to think that you have come this far while the experience. And in that moment, God opened to me the, the, the whole, the whole, my whole life, and I saw 
how proud I have been. And it was never loud, it was never. It was the pride of action. Mm. You don't consult God anymore. You're like, I want to do this job. I, I can rely on my intellect to get it. I want to do this. And I had moved so far away on my own. And I had to find my way back to God. Mm. And to test my way back to God. Oh, you, 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 you can't mess with reality without consequences. The moment you mess something up, you can go. But it's like a rubber band. It will pull you back to where you are. Consulted God. 
He had just defeated the Philistines, but he knew that that wasn't enough. And the strategy that he had used was not going to work. So if he had done what he did the first time, they would have defeated him. Because the first time they were told, go full frontal attack, attack them. And this time God said, go around them. And when you hear sounds, know that I would have gone and smote them for you. So if he had done what he wanted to do, he would have missed the chance of witnessing God deal with his enemies on your own. Your problem is you try to deal with your enemies on your own. Your problem is you love yourself. Your problem is you want them to see you. You want them to see you. You want them to see you. David 
infant worship God. At one time, he worshiped God so much so that his wife, <clears throat> Saul's daughter, was embarrassed of him. And the Bible, and, the, and God closed her womb for it. Amen. God punished her for judging him, for being a worshiper. And if you read the book of First Kings, I, 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 I love First Kings, Second Kings and Chronicles. I, I love them so much. If you read all of them consistently, it's like a movie playing out, an epic movie of sorts. And if you read it, you realize that at every stage, there are very few battles that the children of Israel went to without worshiping and praising. Amen. The praise and worshippers were always at the forefront. Even in battle, even everywhere, there was it, uh, it was it was a practice for them to praise and to worship God. Do you know there are times in your life where some of the things you, you get from God simply come from a play, play, place of praise. There are some times, there are some moments where you don't need to ask anything of God just to praise Him and worship Him Amen. and put Him back on His face and know Him for who He is. There are moments where you don't even need to say or do much, just worship Him. And praising and worshiping somebody requires a humility, it requires a humble heart. It requires you to look within yourself and say, you know what? This is majestic. Hallelujah. And God has given us so many reasons to praise and worship him. God has given us so many reasons to praise him and worship him. One of the things, one of the things that, that make me remain humble as best as I can is when I look back at my whole life, and I see what the kind of God we serve is able to do. Mm. If you honestly sit down and you look at your life, right, right, if you are honest right. with me, there are moments in there mm. where you can look back and say, it could have only been God. One thing that makes me remain humble is that I know exactly where God took me. I know exactly where God took me. Go away. Kwame Mudi. Kusna Tara. Kusna 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 Maget. Kusna Chi. Kusna Kana Pizza in Pizza Slice. I had pizza for the first time in my life when I was a teenager. I started typing, knowing how to type on a laptop or a computer my first year at university. If you look at me, can you tell? No. That's the grace of God. He takes those things that people have rejected. Mm. And yes. so if, if he gives you the yes. grace and the answer, may you never be so comfortable and forget that he took Look at your life and look at yes. what he has done for you. Yes. And may that make you remain yes. humble. Yes. Yes. No, not, nothing in my life pointed to me ever standing in Liverpool. Nothing in my life, nothing in my life ever pointed at me ever being on a plane. I met at more than six primary schools in Gokwe. I see that without buildings, we would sit in class and write on our laps. I remember one time, the, the, it was a thatched building with, with just poles on the side, and this English teacher was teaching us, and a snake literally came from the roof. We killed it and continued with class. Yeah. <laughs> I, I did not even know what kindergarten was. I don't even know all that. I did not even know that. My parents are absolutely the best people in the world and they tried to do all they could, but we were raised in environments where you had no options, you had no aspirations, you did not know who to become. At one point when I was in grade 3, we were the seniors at a school because it was a new school, so it was grade 1, those, we were supposed to be the pioneers. So we were the experimental class grade 3, we were the senior, we were the head girls and the senior prefects at grade 3. It was an experimental school. Hallelujah. And this God of Israel Hallelujah. took that little girl to Oxford University. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It was never because I'm smart. Amen. It is because he is so faithful. And it is the reason why he took me back. Hallelujah. So if I sit here and start feeling more intellectual and more 
conditions. Yeah. You can't get too comfortable. Yeah. It says, fear me and obey my commandments. And if you don't, you will remove protection. Yeah. If you read in the last chapter of Second Chronicles, the children of Israel had gotten so comfortable and forgot where he took them. And he got frustrated and he gave them over to their enemies. Yeah. Which is why we get to the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. It's them trying to rebuild the temple and the walls because they got so comfortable and they forget. May we never forget what is May we always remain humble because of who he is. David, despite being a mighty king, despite he had every reason to be pompous, he had killed Goliath, he had done everything, he had every better reasons than me and you to be proud. But you were still humble and he kept saying, God, who am I? We are strangers in your sight. You just loved us and you just forgave us. And you just gave us this opportunity. May I keep you humble. May you never get so comfortable that you forget where he took you from. Yes. Amen. I'm going to read my last, my last, the last verse. The last scripture is Luke chapter 5 verse 31. Jesus answered them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, Hallelujah. but the sick. Uh -huh. I have not come to call the righteous, uh -huh. but sinners to repentance. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. God does not demand you to be perfect. Mm. It is us, the legalistic church, to know who the nation is. God demands of you to be a person who seeks him. God demands of you to have a repentant heart. Hallelujah. This afternoon as I sit down, I want you to remember that David was like you and me. He struggled with all the things that you struggle with. He struggled with thinking bad over his neighbors. He struggled, he even did, he did even worse things than he did. He was human, he was a human being like me and you. He faltered, he stumbled, he, he, but he always in he, on his knees, he crawled back to Jesus. Hallelujah. God does not call you to be a perfect creature. He calls you to have a perfect relationship with him. He calls you for perfection in him, not on your own. I, I told you my favorite scripture the last time I was here, Jude 25. The Lord, the Jude verse 25, the Lord is able to keep us and prevent, stop us from stumbling. Do you know how hard it is to keep people? You can't keep people that are ungovernable. They are untamable. You can't keep people. They were in Israel, in Egypt, suffering as slaves for 400 years. One week in the jungle, they are hungry. They are saying, were there no graves in Egypt? But they can Human beings can't be kept because that's who we are. Amen. And God doesn't call us to do the things that we can't do. He calls us to have a relationship. He says, if my people who are called by my name, if they can humble themselves, then come to me. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18, come let us do it together. May the sins be like God, let us have to be as white as you, I shall make them as white as you know. So that we explain the screens on it. He wants to talk to you. He wants to reach out to you. He wants you to look up to him. David was not perfect. But he had a repentant heart. He understood the nature of God. He had a humble spirit. He was a praise and worshiper. And he always consulted God. May God give you the grace to do those things in your life. And maybe, maybe then we'll become God's favorites. Because it is never on who we are and what we can do. It is on the strength of who he is and what he enables us.